Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. On behalf of the Cultural Awareness Brigade, welcome to this event. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement originally written by E.O. Smith High School's Deliberation and Discourse Project. This land is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pavesset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land, and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. My name is Sarah Levine, and I'm a member of the E.O. Smith Cultural Awareness Brigade, known as CAB for short. Here, students work toward making a space for students of color in our school. Knowing that we have a community at E.O. Smith allows students of color to feel seen, to build solidarity, and to empower themselves and others. Learning about ourselves and our communities allows us to grow with each other and heal and resist oppression. But our mission expands beyond this, especially as we are not just members of CAP, but also of the community as a whole, each with our own responsibilities to better ourselves and our world. This is the work we set out to do. I hope that this event will give you time to think and reflect, to question, and to plan how you yourselves will take action. Thank you. public speaker, and photographer that leads personal and community narratives to create local dialogue on equity, inclusion, anti-racism, and collaboration. He is the founder of the hashtag I Am Not A Virus. He is the founder of the hashtag I Am Not A Virus, a campaign that highlighted Asian American stories across the diaspora and successfully advocated for the No Hate Act. Through partnerships, they created a coloring book of Asian American heroes that included Southeast Asian, South Asian, LGBTQIA+, and multiracial from STEM, public, and art backgrounds, and a mental health workbook for Asian Americans that has been utilized in over two dozen universities. Mike co-founded Make Us Visible and successfully advocated for bills in Connecticut for the inclusion of AAPI history through authentic and robust community building. And this beer kept me off. And, you know, I thought, when people feel the same way I did, that they knew about the hate crimes that have happened to our community. And I thought Vincent Chin, in 1982, Vincent is getting ready for his wedding. He is at a bachelor party. And he is pulled out and beaten to death. So, hours before he was supposed to get married, he was beaten to death. And his parents and his friends and family that came didn't come to celebrate, they came for a funeral. And I, I talked to all men like Abir Sohi, who, Abir Sohi, who was killed in the wake of 9 11, a grandfather at a gas station, shot and killed and blamed for the terrorist attacks. And I thought Lily Wayne, another Asian American, uh, an Asian American woman that was killed on her college campus by someone that was obsessed with her because he thought Asian women were submissive. I thought about these stories in the wake of the virus, and I knew that we have this history of anti-Asian violence where we are main targets, but are still invisible. And that's such a funny thing to be, to be seen and unseen at the same time. And being a photographer, I wanted to do something, and I didn't know what I could do. I had no clue what I was going to do besides be really upset. So I channeled it into a photo shoot. I invited Asian Americans um, across the state, adoptees, LGBTQI plus, um, Southeast Asian Americans like myself, and multiracial Asian Americans. Who I felt during these times of violence are often unseen, right? And so I wanted to give us a chance to share our stories. So I asked two questions. Um, if you're not a virus, then who are you? And what do you love about yourself? I love barbecuing. I love making cocktails. I love watching MMA fights, right? Um, and the second question I asked was, if you're not a virus, then who are you? 
or I'm sorry, I asked, have you experienced racism during COVID-19? And this was early March, before the pandemic was in full swing, and before we understood what was happening. And um, these folks came in, and they were so happy to share who they were. Some were break dancers, some were rock climbers, some were educators. But when we talked about the violence that Asian Americans were experiencing, the language they used, used to describe it was this language of discomfort. It wasn't, I had a racist experience. It was, someone <laughs> wouldn't open the door for me. And I sat there waiting for them to open the door, and the person behind me came, and the woman opened the door for her, or for him. And she was getting menus from a local store that is in the same plaza as a family's restaurant. And she watched someone else walk in, and her being asked to stay outside, and in her mind she was thinking, perhaps this person called in beforehand. Perhaps there's a reason why I'm outside. Afterwards, her boyfriend comes in, and her boyfriend is white also. And um, the person behind the counter goes and opens the door for her boyfriend. And that's when it struck her that she was being excluded. But she didn't have to lay on you, explain how she felt. Instead, she just felt discomfort and hurt by ignorance, right? Another, another person, a firefighter, who was an adoptee in Middletown, Connecticut. She was followed around. She was wearing her uniform that said the name of her company. That she was an EMT and firefighter. And for 20 minutes, she was followed around inside a stuffy shop where the person was blaming her and accusing her of changing his whole life. This adoptee that is Korean American, that was born and raised here, that has never been outside the US, is being chased around. And he is just speaking to her with so much vulgar and filth. And she would have said something if she wasn't wearing her uniform. Instead, she swallows this as she gets out, and she calls her husband shaky. And they come up with a plan that if she is to go out to a store from now on, that she would have to go with a friend so she could cover for her Asianness. Or she would go with her friend, her husband, maybe her parents. And in photographing these 30 individuals, this, this came up, this thread came up where only one person described what they experienced as racism. And I felt that. My community lacks this language to advocate for ourselves because we don't know our own stories. We are products of, some of us are products of war, genocide, others of adoption, and we don't see ourselves reflected anywhere. So that's how the I Am Not Ours came up. And it became this online group where we were receiving stories from people as far as ways we still. We are hearing stories from California where one person that we heard from California, I photographed her brother in Connecticut, Filipino American. Um, he was the second person I photographed for this project. And a month later, his sister is with her father, who is a Navy vet. And a neighbor starts screaming at him from the car. And so, you know, even though we're separated by so many miles, that fear, that anger, that hurt will still hear. In the wake of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, <coughs> members of the fall from my community, from West Hartford and Hartford, asked me to come up with an I'm Not Threat photo shoot, where I partnered with my friends all, Adrian Billy Smith and Kamora Harrington, and we did a project called I'm Not Threat. And Adrian, Ace came up with the, with the question that when did you realize you were first black in America? That was the question that East wanted to ask participants. And we talked about what the photo should look like. My pictures of Asian Americans were us smiling. I didn't want us to feel like victims. I wanted us to reclaim our joy. And for her, she shared with me, Mike, I'm um, often asked to smile when I'm in public to make others feel safe. So we did two portraits. We did one of people smiling, and a black and white one of them not smiling, to create this message of who's Whose responsibility is it to make our neighbors feel safe? 
And in this process, we photographed 30 African Americans from different multitudes of generations and experiences. Some were LGBTQI+, some were adoptees, some were racial. And everyone had a story about realizing when they were first black in America. And the story that stuck out to us, stuck out to me, right, was the story of a young man who grew up in Hartford and his mother was a, a nurse, his father was a reverend, his grandmother was a school teacher. And he begged his mom to go to this program in a predominantly white neighborhood. And he told her that if you get me into this program, I will not fall. It was like, I will not, I'll find my way to pay through college myself. And he goes there, and the papers he was writing often came back with an accusatory tone, wondering if he plagiarized, wondering if he cheated. How could this person be able to write this well? And his, parent, his mother and his grandparents actually confronted the school. They actually set up a meeting with the <coughs> teachers to talk about this. And he shared that at this meeting, you know, his parents said, why, his mom said, why would you think my son cheated, right? And this young man, when he was growing up, he's in his 40s now, but when he was growing up, every time something happened, he would be the one that got in trouble, right? And when he was talking about this experience, it clicked to me that I was accused of plagiarizing this my entire life from, um, from second grade to about well, high school, I was accused of plagiarizing. Uh, multiple times, and every time that happened, my mom would get a phone call. My grandma would pick up the phone call, and my grandma spoke five languages, but not English. So she would pick up the phone in broken English, asking them to repeat themselves slowly, and my mom would call them back after working the second shift, right? And my mom would come back from these phone calls happy. She was like, they thought you cheated because you're so smart. <laughs> I worked through my life, 35 years old, and I always saw this as a story about me being smart. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize that growing up, we lived in five apartments by the time I turned 16. Whenever the rent went up, my parents would have to find a place to move, and they had to struggle in finding a place that would allow us to be in the same school district. It was not until I was 16 where they worked up to middle class and bought a house. So for me, my mom thought this was a sense of joy, of a sense of like accomplishment that she couldn't help me with my homework, and yet I still succeeded, right? And when I heard this story, I thought about this, this really tragic and marvelous act of being able to anchor and tether ourselves intergenerationally, where every time someone was felt black in America, they would have a parent, a father, a grandparent, a brother, or sister, be able to share with them why this has happened to them. That this will not be the first time you're excluded, right? <clears throat> Asian Americans, from my perspective as a Cambodian American, to working class parents, we didn't have that vision. My parents came here, and within a week of being here, they had to find jobs. They didn't understand how race played a role in their lives, so how can they protect me from the bullying and from the othering? <clears throat> so that, this type of work of intersectionality allowed us to come up with a mental health workbook to ask Asian Americans to start beginning to think about their own experiences through an Asian American era by lens of the whys that happens to us and how does this impact us in policies? Uh, one of the exercises is that you're in a car ride and you're driving three hours away from groceries. What's in the backseat? What's in the cooler? And what are you stacking on? You know, and this becomes a conversation about land access for farmers of color. Uh, what do we grow? How, where do we buy produce? If you don't have a car, how do you stay healthy if all your veggies are coming from a can or they're frozen, right? So it's being a lot allowing us to start to understand our experiences in this framework, I believe allows us to belong in any space that we walk into. Because oftentimes, for me anyways, as an Asian American, I don't see myself in these spaces, right? Um, and when we talk about intersectionality, we think, we go back to hate crimes, right? 
I constantly go back to the acorns and why these things happen to us. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the story of Joseph Aletto. Joseph Aletto was a Filipino American mail worker, postal worker, and his friend, his colleague, wanted a day off, so he asked Joseph to go to go to work for him to cover his shift. So Joseph, being the person he is, covers his friend's shift. On this day, a white supremacist shoots off a synagogue, injures eight people. He runs and he flees, and the police are after him. And then he sees Joseph, and when he looks at Joseph, he cannot tell if Joseph is Mexican or Latino, but he knows Joseph doesn't belong here. So he shoots and kills Joseph. At the vigil with the governor, I believe it was um, Governor Locke was there. He forgets to mention the Filipino community or Joseph's family. And they're sitting there and he runs back after, after the event ends to thank him for being there. And again, that's a type of invisibility that we feel, right, in this intersection of space. Um, let's see, Ricky Birdsong was a black basketball coach. And Ricky Birdsong was retired and he was outside guarding with his sons. And a white supremacist shoots him after killing six Jews, or not killing six Jews, he shoots six Jews, three all black men, and a Taiwanese American. And during this violence, he kills Ricky Birdsong in front of his kids. And he also kills Juan Jun Yoon, who was a Korean American student going to church. So when I see these, these moments, right, of violence that was coming after Asian Americans, for me, the idea of stopping anti-Asian hate wasn't just to protect Asian Americans, but it was a call to action to protect all of our communities. And that's why we created this calling book there, where there were multiracial experiences, intersectional experiences. And for me, this all matters because I can't separate the parts of myself. I am middle class now, but I tell you I am still, I can still feel uncomfortable being a working class for growing up in a working class place. When I was working in New York City, I shot a video for Vogue magazine. And in this video, there's a woman wearing $40,000 shoes. $40,000 was what my mom worked, minimum wage, for 80 hours, two jobs. So for me, that was my reference to these shoes. And I can tell you that like, being in that space made me so uncomfortable at that time, understanding these things. We can't put away our identities to make ourselves comfortable. You know, we have to become okay with that conflict that we feel, that imposter syndrome that I feel often when I'm in these spaces. We have to become comfortable with that and share our stories to take up the space that have historically haven't been given to us, right? We shouldn't be asking for that space, we should be taking that space. And I know me sitting here, it's easy to say, but I tell you when I had to do this in my place of work, in other situations or settings, my body begins to feel nervous. My hands start to shake. I feel really, I feel pressure, right, in the pit of my stomach, that if I say something right now, will people feel a certain way about me? But I, I take that time to breathe and say what I have in mind, right? Because I think most people want to help, they want to do good, and it's an opportunity for them to understand where you're coming from. And um, you know, when I share this with all, um, you know, I'm thinking about my my friend Scott. Scott is white. He was the family coordinator of West Hartford. And I'll share with Scott my discomfort that every book my child reads in kindergarten or pre-K were talking animals, and there were no Asian Americans or any black families or brown families or LGBT families, but he's had a talking mama, a talking giraffe, a talking dog, a talking bear. And I didn't know how to, my parents never went to my school summer conferences, so I did have a framework on how do I, how do I talk to my kid's teacher, because that just didn't happen in my life, right? And so I, I reached out to Scott and I said, Scott, what do I do? I feel this way right now. And Scott walked me through this process of that I could 
call my kids' teachers, I can call my kids' principal before the school starts, and actually have conversations with them. And it's all of how I feel with my kid. So when my kid wants to pack spam and rice, or Cambodian sausage and rice, I can call Meredith and say, Meredith, my son is packing this food. Can you make sure no one says anything to my kid? And if they do, can you protect them? And I talk to my son too about what it means to bring this food in that may be different. And my kid comes home that day and he goes, Daddy, no one said anything bad about my food. And Meredith sends me an email that says, Mike, um, hold it well today, no one said anything, and he was able to enjoy his meal. I didn't know how to do that without a friend like Scott to be able to demystify this kind of approach on what parent-teacher partnerships would look like. And I'm so eternally grateful because every teacher and principal that my kids have had, they've had two principals with two different kids, but um, my eldest has you know, had three teachers. The teachers have been fantastic individuals, right? I feel my kids safe and seen. But those were lessons I had to learn because my parents weren't there to teach me. And if I didn't have a friend like Scott or someone else that knew this, I would have been that parent that was on the outside. You know? And I think this is when, and I go back to hate cars and I go back to storytelling because I feel like these are the moments where we can start feeling seen and building that community we want to build together. Right? And um, I guess recently, you know, and I want to share stories of joy also. There are stories of joy. Our communities are full of joy and happiness. And that's often unseen or unheard of or only seen in trauma spaces. But recently, for my work, I'm documenting a series on farmers of color for the Connecticut Historical Society. So I'm working with farmers of color, and there were a group of farmers in Sinsbury, Connecticut, that were kicked off the land. All eight farmers were kicked off the land. And it's kind of, you know, my friend that I filmed yesterday, she talked about how, how important the system must be that these farmers all found each other on this one piece of land because there's not many places for them to grow. And so they're all there and now they are all got from the land. Um, she's building a homestead with her dad. She's building a homestead with her parents. Her parents came here in 1986 as Cambodian refugees. They spent nine months hiding in the jungles to survive, right? They were eating wild potatoes. They were covered in leeches. For nine months, they spent time in the in the jungles before they were able to reach a refugee camp. In the refugee camp, they got here in 1986, four years later than uh, my family. And you know, growing up, she played with clay. Her dad, when he got here, within the first week of him being here, a tech agency placed it to him in Canadian College. And he did speak English at the time. He spoke broken English that he learned from the camps. And they put him in Canadian College. And he was a custodian. That was his first and only job, was a custodian. And people looked down on him for having this job. And he was worried that he didn't speak English. And, but like, you know, you don't need to speak English if you're cleaning the toilets, right? And so at high school, he would go and learn English. And he gets placed there. His wife will surely get placed as a cafeteria woman, right? She was working in the cafeteria. And they built a life together, working these long hours of 12 hour days. And eventually, he was able to send all three kids to college, right? Pay for the college, send them to college, buy two homes. And it's a moment of pride for him that he was able to get there. And he's reflecting on this now as they begin farming. He's just retired and he has all this time. So I asked, what do you do with the time you have? Like it's, you know, and he is, he's farming with his daughter. And he shares with me that his regret that he has had has been that his children came. Whew, sorry. It's just as close to home. His children came to our bedroom house. that he couldn't help them with their homework, even if he wanted to. I was raised by my grandmother. It was her birthday yesterday, and um, so I had to miss my grandmother. But these young folks, they came to an empty house. 
for 20 years, right? For 20, 30 years. And they didn't know how to unpack that. They had to live with that. And they had no time with their parents growing up. And now they don't live together. And he says that was his regret. You know, that to survive meant that he couldn't have a family or couldn't see what his family. And now his grandkids are there every other weekend. And he is beginning to farm with his wife and his daughter. And I thought to myself, of my own mom and my own dad, my parents are like the best grandparents. My kids see them once a week. Um, we live in the same town. My dad built a gazebo when he had time in his backyard. When the weather's warm, they'll bring my kids there. And my mom will cook chicken nuggets, ribs, stir fry, and, and cut fresh fruits because she doesn't know what my kids will be in the mood for. And I'm just like, Mom, don't give them choices. I had no choice, and I had to eat leftovers. You know? And I thought about, you know, my parents always remark that my kids look like me. And that they remind them of myself and my brother when we were younger. And I thought to myself, isn't this also a form of healing? To be able to make up for lost time. You know, when they take care of my kids, they probably see my, me and my siblings, right? And knowing my Asian American experience, and the history that brought me here as a Cambodian American, I'm able to look at him as an adult or as someone with a lot less hurt. And I think that's been the marvelous act of storytelling and information because I know that the story may resonate with people here who work really long hours as you put food on the table, you know? But without the space where we can share ourselves, we don't make those bonds where we can build together. And yeah, and for me, it was discovering hate crimes and storytelling and utilizing storytelling as a bridge to move communities together, to be able to advocate for bills, to advocate for things that don't just impact one community, but impact everyone. Because we don't live here in silos. We choose to live here together. What does that mean to be together? Thank you. section um, now, so if you have questions, we, you'll have a chance to ask those. Um, I'll start off with my own question. Do you believe that the work that you've been doing and the work of fellow activists to increase awareness and things like that has shifted the experience of realizing you're an Asian in America, kind of like what you were saying um, about for the black individuals, the moment that they realized they were black in America, do you think your children it's been a positive experience that's given them that realization, or is it still a negative one? I think it's a positive experience for my children. I think that they are proud to be who they are, and I think all children deserve that. You know, I think for me, what I'm learning now are these different experiences, right? There's a slur for Asian Americans about our lives. <coughs> the first time I was called that slur, I was in fifth grade, and I think about this moment often on this earth that we actually to each other. And the kid that called me that, we had a group of neighborhood friends and we were bad kids. We would find lumber for our households and um, we would build a tent or a fort with hammer and nails. And uh, half of us got kicked out of the club and the all half did it. So we broke down the fort, right? And the white boy that called me the slur, it was his mom that called me the slur. It was his mom that called me. He was really hurt and he was really angry. And it was not until I was an adult where I kind of understood where he may have been coming from. We all knew at that time he was the poorest of all of us. While we were all living in apartments, he was the one living in Section 8. And while we had Super Nintendos, he still had a Nintendo with a Black Noise TV. And when you're young, you don't see these different aspects of our lives, right? So when we broke out the fort, he probably felt that we ripped something away from him, that he desperately needed. And I regret that 
you know, aspect all our friends doing that. But um, I've been reflecting on this moment, right? And we saw each other park, and his mom goes, you know those C words, go beat them up. And my dad takes me and my brother and drags us to the car. And my mom was so angry at my dad for doing this. My mom was like, let them fight. Let them fight. And at that moment, I knew I wanted to be more like my mom, who was vocal. So like, the idea of a submissive Asian woman never, I never understood that. Right? Like, my family's full of strong women. But my dad was so quiet. And that bothered me for a long time. Right? And the story's going to go in two directions. Um, the first direction is, I've been having this conversation with um, black and Latino members of the community. And they don't speak for everyone, but we're speaking for our own personal experiences. And my friend shares that in her culture, it's always been used as a term of endearment. So, I don't know if y'all saw when Cardi B, who was a rapper, used the word to describe her child. And there were a few Asian American actors that were getting upset, and I felt that it was wasted energy, and it was time for a conversation. Because for this word, it was used as a term of endearment. It still hurts me, but it was used for a term of endearment. I think that was a conversation we should have. And I met a Chinese Peruvian the other day that um, shared that when she was called this in Peru, it was out of endearment, it was out of love. She was an eighth Chinese. But when she came to Connecticut and Hartford, the other Latino students, my next students, would call her this to other her and tell her that she shouldn't be speaking Spanish, even though she was Peruvian and she had no connection besides blood to the eyes. And the other part of the story, and I think this is the part of my, my child, right? I didn't understand my parents growing up. I did not understand them at all. And I recently interviewed my parents this year. I took them to Philadelphia up to the promoting market, part of the promoting market. And I talked to my dad and my mom. Uh, my dad, I only understand why he made me stay quiet at that time and put us in the car. My dad was the son of a couple that didn't work out. So he was raised by his grandparents. And his dad and his mom ended up having other families where he was the eldest. And he lived with his grandparents. And his dad was a soldier in the Khmer, the Khmer Army. And his last memory of his dad were that they were on a boat ride. It was, it was morning and the sun began to rise. And he's not making eye contact with his dad because he's shy and he's eight years old and he doesn't know what to say. And he doesn't know how to process his emotions. So he's just running his hands into the water. And that's the last memory he has of his dad. His dad ends up being captured by the Khmer Rouge and held in a prison until 1975 when the Vietnamese invaded, they killed his dad. They would have killed my dad too, and they knew he was the son of a soldier. So for him, remaining quiet and just putting his head down was a survival technique, right? And I didn't see that at that moment that my dad was surviving, and that he had this experience that came before me. And during this trip, I also found out that my dad was fostered by two Sicilian Americans. Uh, and this was so funny to me because my dad doesn't really cook for himself, but whenever he does, it's like chicken and pork cutlets, um, and then like Italian food, and then it just made no sense. <laughs> like, we always, my parents always have tomatoes and bread crumbs in the house, but we don't really cook that. <laughs> and so yeah, like that, I learned that with my dad. If we have any audience questions, we can transition to that. But I know you mentioned that um, like Asian parents often can feel like they're forced out of like um, having an active role in their children's education. Is there any like thing that you'd like to see implemented in like schools or communities to kind of help with that or bridge the gap? And this is on Zoom as the day's remote learning. 
and I saw my son squeal. He got so excited, and he goes, we have a rice cooker. <laughs> and our rice cooker makes this like sound. It's like a broken song. It's like, da -da -da -da. <laughs> um, and my son sings that too. <laughs> and um, Jill, without missing a beat, ends up ends up um, asking the all students, do they help their parents cook? So all these kids are talking to the, the things. Like you have one kid talking about making all um, pierogies for pop shop, right? <laughs> You have another student talking about what they made with spaghetti. And it was just a moment where my son felt seen and other students would feel seen during the Asian American story. Um, another thing that I think is really rewarding, and I see this because all, when I walked into um, Meredith's, Ms. Gallinauer's class, she had this bookshelf in her class that had diverse stories of communities of color, LGBTQIA plus families. And I tell you, like when we saw that, so many parents just stopped by. Which is like, this is wonderful, and so we were able to come in as guest readers, right? And that was a really great moment. And my son right now is in um, Miss Rand's class, who is a girl, also amazing, right? She looks for things for Asian American Heritage Month, Black Heritage Month, and she actively looks for it. And she's retiring this year, but um, having those things, you can see that with. When I see Valenado's all uh, Meredith's class, I can see Asian American parents just stop by and talk to her when they're picking up their kids. But it's because they see seeing there. They feel like this is a safe place. And when you get that at such an early age, for me as parents, I'm like, this is wonderful. I can have this conversation with my teachers. I can have this conversation with my superintendent. Um, last thing on um, partnerships. Tom Moore was the former superintendent for West Hartford. And we created this type of partnership work. So when the shooting at Atlanta happened, Tom Moore and Rosina Haskins, who's leaving at the end of the year, um, and Scott reached out to have a statement to protect the Asian American families and to acknowledge the hurt that Asian Americans were feeling. Um, they asked me to help them pen a letter, and so it could come from the community and from them. And there were parts of the letter where I acknowledged that Asian Americans with kids in nail salon or with parents in nail salons and massage parlors and grocery stores are scared right now and restaurants. And I thought the line was going to be asked to be removed, but they kept the line. This came with a book list as well as film list and things that parents can do to talk to their kids. It was circulated within 24 hours of the shooting at Atlanta. I'm proud to say that that was the first letter that came from a superintendent in the state or in the country. So we packaged it for other parents to use, and we were receiving letters from Washington State, California, from Georgia, well, from a preschool 10 miles from the incident, where they used that, that thing that Tom produced and the school district produced to create their own letter of support. And that was really wonderful to see. We received over 50 letters from other places. Your mention of the Atlanta shooting, you think of the shooting a few months ago after the Lunar New Year. Did you, did you see a shift in the community and kind of a focus on the elderly in the Asian American community after that incident? Um, or did you feel like there was still a strong focus on how it affected the youth and how they were perceiving themselves in, themselves in America following the shooting? I think that affected a lot of us. I think one of the conversations that was happening during that time was that it was an Asian on Asian shooting, right? And I don't think that mattered because that experience was real for all of us. We all thought it was an hate crime when it came up. Um, and then the other shooting at um, Half Moon Bay, again, it's another shooting that's intersectional. You can't remove the working class narrative or the minor former narrative from it. I think the difference of response was that our community was prepared to connect it. I remember the wake of Atlanta. My friend Mimi Gonzalez, who is um, Afro Latina, put together a visual in West Hartford and gave the mic to Asian Americans. And in the shooting of Atlanta, or the shooting in California for Lunar New Year's, it impacted so many of us. Um, Senator Omar and Grace put together a visual in the Capitol. We brought out speakers. Um, you know, Senator Andy was there. Um, Senator Tony Wong was there. 
And so there was a vigil in Hartford. And what we saw were we saw community members from New Haven, from Hartford, from Glastonbury, from all across, from stores, who are all at the Capitol. They had seats for all 25 of us, but 150 people showed up. And it was covered by news outlets. It was covered by so many folks. And I felt, you know, I, I spoke at the event, but uh, for me, I think one of the most emotional feelings for me was to hear a uh, Cambodian American elder who is the executive director of the Cambodian Buddhist Society Temple. He made a speech, and he came here as a young RPG, right? He came here at eight, and he spoke the way my cousins do, where there's a slight accent. For me to hear that type of accent in this room was really made me feel really safe, right? It made me feel that there was this generational connection happening. I don't know if that answers my question. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone? I have a question about how you like opened conversation about your family history with your parents. Because I know like I want to learn more about like members of my family and their experiences, especially like my immigrant mother and like it's just hard to figure out how to approach the topic. So how did you approach that? So I was asked to do this for my parents because I'm running a program for Asian and Black student in Hartford. And my um, my department asked me to for my parents and I was so upset by this. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so glad I did. I think it's letting them be human, giving them the space to talk, right? And letting them such a devil experience. I think sometimes when we talk about, or I'm using the Cambodian experience, right? There are times when we may ask, how did the war impact you? What was it like living in the Khmer Rouge, right? Like, what was it like living in the Khmer Rouge? And I think those questions don't allow them to express themselves beyond certain things. So asking them about their relationship with their parents, their relationship with their, their grandparents, I think that's a way into the conversation because it's you get so much information out of that. And, um, I think to be Cambodian American is to receive a bunch of bad advice, or like a bunch of advice that you will, that you're just like, why are you telling me I'm five? You know? <laughs> when I was eight, my mom told me never to do book packs. And I was like, why was I telling eight year olds like that? Like, it just makes no sense. But um, if I can, I, I'd love to share one story. It is, it is happy, it is hopeful, and it's traumatic. I don't know if you would want to hear it. So my mom tells me on this car ride, we're talking about, I asked her, why did my grandma raise her siblings? And in my culture, the eldest, after your parents died, you were supposed to raise your siblings. This is why when my parents were always working, I was the sort part for my siblings. Right, you take on that parentification role. So I asked her, why did my grandma take care of her siblings? Uh, my mom tells me never to see a Chinese psychic. <laughs> What? <laughs> so I find out um, my great grandfather was a merchant from China and he ran the timber industry. And he came from China and he did business in Cambodia and he'd go back and forth so he was bilingual, but he wasn't Chinese. And he sees my great grandmother who is the daughter of a Chinese family and she's the only daughter of a wealthy family. And when he was in China, they told him he would die at 43, the day his youngest daughter is born. Why would you tell anyone this? <laughs> and uh, during, this, during this time, my, um, my mom shares with me that during this pregnancy with my great aunt, who I met, um, who's no longer with us, she's about 17 years younger than my grandma. And my grandma has always treated her as a mother figure. Like my grandma was always a mother figure and never like a sister, you know? And so he's serving in his land, and one of his employees drops a log on him. And his leg is infected and it's in so much pain, and it's two months away from the due date. So he's going kind of, he's really angry, he's upset. He wants to terminate this pregnancy because he feels that the spirit is coming. Right? And so
So my great aunt is born that day, and within 12 hours she passes away. And this is why my grandma raises her, her siblings, right? Or part of the reason. Uh, a lot of people try to cite me is my late uncle was told he'll die at 65, and he died at 65. And he passed away two years ago. So for my mom, it was like all coming back to her to not see a Chucky study. I do want to see one. Because <laughs> 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 me not to. But so I go, well, where was my grandmother's older sister? My mom tells me that she actually moves to a different province in Cambodia. And she is a wealthy farm owner. So she has land and she has people working for her. And when the choirs came in, her brother-in-law was always jealous of her wealth. And when the choirs came in power, they told you, give us all your jewelry and everything to us. And so she gives them her stuff. But her brother-in-law goes and tells them that she's hidden half of it. So they search her place and find it. So they kill her in public on the atomic ground so everyone can see her. My great-grandmother is there at that time. And she sees this and she runs out and she's screaming. So they kill her too. My cousin, who is my great aunt's um, grandson, and in our culture we call him cousins, he is 12 or 13, he's only a few years younger than my mom. He sees all this unfold. As someone grabs him, grabs him and covers his mouth so he doesn't scream. And he survives the war. And this is how my my grandma finds out that her sister and her mother, two of her sons, died in students' channels, right? And um, in the story, my mom shares with me that in the 2000s, she went to a temple in Darien. We never go to Temple Darien. I didn't know there was a temple there as a house. She goes to a temple there, and she sees a woman in these sharp earrings. Just these beautifully sharp, shaped earrings. So my mom starts a conversation with her. But eventually my mom asks, are you from this village? And she's like, how did you know? And my mom's like, I used to spend my childhood there um, with, when I would visit my great aunt and my aunt. And then the woman goes like, well, what are their names? And so my mom shares, shares their names. And my mom, I'm the first generation with Cambodian names, and I found this out during this interview. Um, everyone else was named by my mom's great grandfather, who's still alive, and they all have Chinese names. So my mom shares the names, and the woman just turns white. Three months later, she sells everything she owns in Connecticut and moves out to California. And this is the day of calling cards. I don't know if anyone remembers calling cards. This is the day of calling cards, and my, mom, my grandma sponsored by um, her, her grand nephew and his family, um, where his daughter to go to school with her. Well, and all that. So they finally get a phone with him about well, three or four months later and they're like, hey, do you know this person? And they describe what they look like, their name. And he pauses and he's like, yeah, they helped commit those murders. And I am hearing this for the first time, and I think this is where we, when we hear family stories, we don't really think about how it impacts us, right? And I'm so angry. And it felt like the war was so close to me at that moment. I felt like I was there too when I experienced this. And I was so angry and I didn't know if I should cry or just scream. I love my grandma. I know that my grandma has to deal with this hurt. So I asked my mom, what'd you do? My mom says, she goes, we had to let it go. She was like, she said that, she said, maybe perhaps we did something to harm them in a previous life. And in this life, they came to get their like right their retribution. And if we do something to do this, like we go and hurt them and do something else, this covers not follow us to the next life and where we meet each other. So what it be best to just go our separate ways? And then my dad says that you had to treat it like it was a different life. And that people back then had to survive any way they knew how. And sometimes it was easier to be their brother than it was to be the thing. And that all happened on a story about Asking about education, you know. I am out of words <laughs> for the story. Do you think that having these kinds of conversations with your parents and then encouraging 
the same activities with your kids? Is changing the way that your kids' is peers or to your interacting with their parents, and if they'll possibly have these same kind of hopes to connect with their parents in the same way as they really don't know when they're open? I think finding space for parents to feel that they walk in schools is an important step. You know, there are guest readers at our school that come in and volunteer. And what I've seen in their friends when I volunteer is that they hear the Asian American story, they hear the call, you know, a black story or a Latinx story. And they're able to make really, they're able to see in their heads connections to their own lives. Right? And that allows them to feel more connected to each other or shared experiences. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any final guests? Uh, I thank you first of all for sharing all of the stories. I think storytelling is really kind of a powerful way to share, you know, experiences even if uh, like we weren't there for those experiences. Um, I just have a story to add and then a question. Uh, so you were talking about how uh, there's, you know, all of these stories happen everywhere from um, people that you've met who have also shared. Uh, so I have a story from like a few months ago in West Hartford. So I think it's kind of important for us to remember how close this hatred and racism is. Uh, so I was with my friend because we were going to the Thai restaurant in West Hartford. Uh, and then after, uh, as we were walking toward the parking lot, um, we suddenly could hear like, oh, excuse me, excuse me. And then we turn around and there's this, this like, tall white man kind of like walking really fast towards us um, and then he's like can I ask you a really stupid question and then I instinctively say yes which I should not have but I was like <laughs> usually students are like can I ask a question and I said yes and then so I said yes um, he was like why is one of you wearing a mask but the other one isn't and then he's like walking closer and closer um, to us and we started walking really fast towards the parking lot which in retrospect, we shouldn't have because there's less people in the parking lot. Um, so, we, but we were just like, let's get to the car, uh, and then we tried to half explain it, half walk really fast, uh, and then people. He was pretty loud, but no one around us really kind of stopped him or uh, even stopped. I think to see what was going on. Um, but in the end, we like got into the car. We he was like, he was like, oh, thank you, and then it was fine. But. It could have been not fine, we didn't know. Um, but when we were in the car, we were like going over the scenario, we were like, what should we have done? Uh, instead of maybe going to the parking lot um, and maybe stopping him earlier. But yeah, like hearing all your stories made me think of that and how everyone everywhere is experiencing some sort of the same story, um, and even uh, in a lot of cases, even worse. Uh, but my question is back to school. So uh, there are kids who, like I think you were saying in response to uh, someone's question, for your kids, they're proud of who they are, and I think that's really, really wonderful. Uh, there are a lot of kids who aren't proud of who they are. Um, they don't understand where their parents are coming from. They get bullied at school for their identity. What advice or what would you say um, to those kids? It took me a long time. Thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry you went through that. It took me a long time to find my community, right? To find my voice. And the advice I would give would be to seek out other people, right? Through experiences. There is going to be conflict. There's always going to be conflict even when you're free or you want the same thing. There's going to be conflict there too because you might not think that the roadmap is the same way. For me, it was and an introduction to Asian American poetry. My mentor was um, Reggie Capico, and Reggie Capico is a Filipino American queer male, and I am a Cambodian cis male. But he gave me so many books. He gave me so many books and encouraged me to read it um, from different diverse voices, like Essex Temple, who was a queer black man that wrote about AIDS. Um, he gave me books by um, Duran Locks, which is a working class white woman. Um, Sandra Cisneros, Mexican American, and that helped me kind of find the language I can do to find 
by my tribe, right? To buy people and to engage in conversations. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. And if there's a teacher that you trust, I've been on for this project. We had over 30 students apply for it, and I've been having the thing about the students that are in debt, a lot of them, you know, if there's a teacher you trust that you want to have that conversation with, that's a great, that's a great place to start. You know? If there's a teacher that's that you can trust and you can be vulnerable with you feel comfortable doing so, reach out to that educator. Do we have any more audience questions? Yes? Okay. Oh, what do you expect from uh, each American history or studies? Like here's a class. I expect local histories. I think that when we share our stories, when we share them among peers, we're building connections, we're bridging connections. When we share them with policymakers and legislators, if something else is happening, you're giving them insight into something that they haven't understood before. But what I'm expecting from this class is I'm expecting young folks to become better aware of local histories on the Asian Americans inside their own, their own towns or their own states. So I think that's when it matters, when it's uh, east of uh, California. I also think that by having this separate curriculum, you're able to build up this literacy where like we live in an amazing time where there is an African American studies, there is a Latino studies, a Holocaust studies, but it allows us to build bridges across <clears throat> identity groups, right? So that's that's what I'm looking for is that there's more understanding across different experiences. And I think that we're definitely getting there with the new additions to the US and the curriculum. Any other questions? Yes? Two people saw each other, they didn't like each other, one pulled out a gun. 
and I think about what the model minority that it takes from us. It takes away these stories of working class Asians that are in restaurants, that are in nail salons, that are working in these spaces where you have underpaid like, people that are being forced to work as fast as they can. I think you have communities come in that are trying to treat themselves as something joyous, and they may only have $15 for that week, and they expect a good service. And you have these struggles that are happening. And what the model minority that does is it stops us from understanding that exact interaction of two communities that are both hurting for different reasons, right? But it's the same reason, that we don't have enough income. But you have these two communities hurting without understanding the, the hurt that's being inflicted on each other or on that, right? And I feel like with the model minority myth, it generalizes this whole experience where we don't see this large subset of Asian Americans that are just trying to survive. Yep. Any last questions? Um, I try personally to do a lot of anti-racism work, and, and certainly there's some, um, a lot of it is, is um, focused on um, blacks, but as far as Asian American, there's some overlap. There's mm -hmm. certainly things that, I, that I've gone to, speakers I've heard, like you, for instance, that, you know, um, that bridge into other ethnicities and other cultures. Um, but if I wanted to actively be, um, like you mentioned the, um, I don't know if it was a, a vigil or what was at the Capitol where they had seats for 20 people and there was 150, like if I wanted to be more actively kind of paying attention to um, Asian American um, events, protests, I'm not sure the word I want to use, but um, is there like, a particular organization in Connecticut or something where I could follow them and, and be more actively involved or, or know about what's going on specific more to the Asian American. Thank you for that question. Um, AMAC is the Asian Pacific American Council. It was started about 20 plus years ago by one of my mentors, Angela Rolo. But they are in Connecticut and they do events and they do listening tours. Um, there's also Make Us Visible Connecticut, which I co-founded with um, a few other amazing people like Paul Tran and Jason Chang. I won't post up. Jason does all the posting, so God bless him, because that's a lot of work. But yeah, that's, those are ways to find out of events happening across Connecticut. And APAC is APAC? Yep. Thank you for asking that question. All right, so can we give a round of applause for next year? series is going to be on May 4th. It'll be a conversation with Sandy Grande about the Native American experience and challenges that these communities still face in the United States. Um, and before you leave, please take some of the food that's still out there. Um, and we have a poster on the board over there from our first speaker event with Frank Tewitt, um, deciding where Eo Smith is as a monocultural to anti-racist uh, community and school. So please put your sticker on that board of where you think we are. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. And thank you once again on my keynote for spending this evening.